Welcome to One Off Coder. I'm Dr. G. Vang, and today I want to show some cool and exciting ways for you to store your data in Python. I call these storage structures data containers or simply containers. I'll ease into these new approaches by first showing the usual ways to store data and then shed light on more modern ways of doing so. You'll learn how to write cleaner code by separating concerns and removing boilerplate code. Let's reach for success. Let's get going. Here's an outline of this video's talk. I'll go over the tuples and name tuples. I'll talk about dictionaries and a third-party library to ease the pain of dictionary navigation. Finally, we'll jump into data classes. Data classes were introduced in Python version 3.7 and should replace full-blown traditional classes in many situations. You should easily see the value of data classes as they provide a cleaner way to write lightweight classes to store data. All these things, tuples, dictionaries, and data classes are what I call containers. Tuples and dictionaries are anemic, to borrow a concept from Martin Fowler, as they are simply containers and provide no business logic for the data they store. Data classes, on the other hand, can be anemic or be modified to become logic-rich classes. I like tuples. They are immutable, meaning they cannot be changed once created. For coding, immutability means minimizing or having no side effects. Here, I have a tuple of data for a person. I have stored a person's first name, last name, age, weight, and status if they are a coder. But there's some problems with using a tuple. When I print the tuple, the values are space delimited. The output is cool, except the output gives no indication of which values map to which fields. I'll have to remember the order in which I inserted the values, and memorization will frequently fail. It's better if the output just somehow knew and indicated the meanings of the values. Furthermore, if I have to access elements from the tuple, now I have to use bracket notation with indices. The indices are meaningless, and the bracket seems verbose and burdensome to type. Name tuples correct the shortcomings of regular tuples. With name tuples, you have to make an import from the collections module. To define a name tuple, I simply create a name for which I will use to instantiate the name tuple. When I invoke the name tuple function, there's two arguments I need to supply. The first one is the name, and the second one is a space or comma delimited list of field names. Instantiating a name tuple is easy. It's just like creating a regular tuple, except now I place the name of the name tuple at the beginning. If you look at the instantiation, it looks identical to instantiating a class. When I print a name tuple, I get a field to value mapping as the output. Also, when I access values in a name tuple, I can use dot notation. No more brackets and indices. The intention is much more clear with name tuples. Dictionaries are another type of data container. I like dictionaries as they can naturally and easily store nested data. When I print a dictionary, I get the field to value mapping, which is what I want so that I don't have to guess the context of a value. However, if I want to get a value, I have to use bracket notation and the key to get that value. Accessing values is quite verbose using dictionaries. EasyDict is a third-party library that can be used to remove the pain point of using brackets and keys to access or navigate to values. Note the import of EasyDict and the aliasing of EasyDict as eDict. If I use EasyDict, I simply wrap it around a dictionary. For this negligible inconvenience, now I can use dot notation to get the values that I want. Also, you can treat an EasyDict as a plain dictionary. You can still use bracket and key notation if you want to access values. If you print an easy dict, the output will be the same as printing a dictionary. Very cool. Tuples and dictionaries are nice, but favor using name tuples and easy dictionary. They give context to your data values and make navigating them easier using dot notation. If you want to move in a more advanced direction, you'll probably move in the direction of traditional classes to store your data. And why not? Traditional classes are powerful as you can use them not only to store data, but build secondary and business logic around the data. But defining a traditional class is time consuming. There's quite a lot of boilerplate code to write. You'll have to write the constructor. You may have to clutter your validation code into your accessors and mutators. Also, if you want your class to play nice with Python, you'll have to implement quite a number of double underscores or dunder methods. 
Remember, dunder methods are also called magic methods. There's a happy medium between tuples and dictionaries and traditional classes. And that's with data classes. Data classes were introduced in Python 3.7. You can make your data classes lightweight to behave like tuples and dictionaries, or you can modify them to be as sophisticated as traditional classes. Data classes come with batteries included. You won't have to write boilerplate code. With the help of third-party APIs, you can also validate your values in well-defined places. This separates validation concerns into their own areas, making your code cleaner. Data classes use decorators, type hints, and field-level information to ease the pain of using classes to store data and logic. I start off defining a person class and applying the data class decorator to this class. Also, inside the person class definition, I define all the fields of the class with type hints. Where is the constructor? I don't need one, as a constructor or init dunder will be created for me based on the fields I have defined. As you can see, creating an instance of a data class is no different from creating an instance of a traditional class or named tuple. Also, printing an instance of the data class will return a meaningful string representation. That's because the ripper magic method is automatically provided by our data class decorator. Lastly, note that we can use dot notation to access the value of each field. This example makes the person class smells like both a name tuple and a traditional class. But things get better from here. If we want our data class to be immutable, we can set frozen to true on the data class decorator. Freezing a data class makes it like a tuple where once we set the values, we cannot modify them anymore. Additionally, freezing a data class makes it hashable. By default, frozen is set to false, and when frozen is false, calling the hash function on an instance of this data class will result in a type error. I guess you can say, to get hashing to work, turn on the frozen flag. You'll notice that, in addition to type hints, I've also supplied field level information. Field level information is specified by the field method. There's quite a number of flags to turn on or off for each field. Here, I specify that all fields except for the isCoder field be considered for creating a hash value. So I've created three instances of person here, John1, John2, and John3. All these instances contain the same value except for John3, which has false for the isCoder field. Comparing the hash of John1 to John2, they should be equal. Also, comparing if the hash of John1 to John3 are equal should return true. The reason the hashes for all three instances are equal is because all the values are identical. The isCoder field differs, but we have specified not to consider it in creating the hash. Lastly, since I specified to freeze instances of this data class, I cannot mutate the values later on. Attempting to do so will result in a frozen instance error. So to make a data class hashable, we have to set frozen to true. The question is, are only immutable data classes hashable? The answer is no. If we have immutable data class, we can set unsafe hash to true, and the data class will now be hashable. Here, everything is the same as the last example, except I allow for instances of the data class to be mutable. After I mutate the age of John 1, its hash will differ from John 2 and John 3. There's another argument I can flip on with the data class decorator, and that's order. When order is set to true, the equality comparison dunders will be provided. I have instantiated P1 and P2 here. They differ by only the first name. I then proceed to apply the equality comparison operators on P1 and P2. P1 less than P2 should be false. P1 greater than P2 should be true. P1 is equal to P2 should be false. P1 less than or equal to P2 should be true. P1 greater than or equal to P2 should be true. The ripper flag on the data class decorator is already set to true by default. When this flag is true, a ripper dunder will be provided. In this example, I'm providing field level information to include or exclude certain fields from appearing in the string representation. Here, I'm including only the first and last names and excluding all other fields. Pretty easy. 
The init flag on Data Class Decorator is already set to true. This flag controls whether or not an init function or constructor is provided. I can provide field level information to include or exclude fields from the constructor. Here I want to include only the first and last name as required arguments to the constructor. Additionally, for fields that I have excluded to be passed into the constructor, I provide default values. When providing field level information, I can specify a factory to provide a default value. I've added an ID field to the person data class. The ID field is just a unique identifier, and when the user does not provide a value for the ID, then one is provided by the getID lambda. The getID lambda simply returns the milliseconds pass epoch back to be used as the ID. The post init dunder is a hook into the lifecycle of a data class. After an instance of a data class is initialized, post init will be called. Here, after initialization, I make sure the first name and last names are titled. So, although I'm passing in lowercase john and lowercase doe, when I print this instance, John and Doe will have their first letter uppercase. Init var allows me to pass in a value for a field at instantiation time without storing it and using it during post initialization to do other things. Here I have a field favorite language where I have applied init var. I've set its value to none. This field will not be stored because of init var. However, during post initialization, I can reference this field and make decisions based off of it. In this case, if a favorite language has been supplied, I then flip its isCoder value to true or false as appropriate. In the first instantiation of the person data class, isCoder will be false since I did not supply a favorite language. In the second instantiation, isCoder will be true since I did supply a favorite language. It's super easy to convert a data class instance to a tuple or dictionary. Notice that I've imported the asTuple and asDict functions. After I instantiate a person data class, I can then invoke these functions on the instance to create a tuple or a dictionary. Too easy. A data class can inherit from another one. I have defined a person data class. I then define a student data class that inherits from the person one. The student data class has a field called grades. Look at the type hint of grades. Grades will be a list of strings. I've also specified to use the list function as the default factory for this field. At the bottom, I instantiate a student as I would a person. Later, I can add grades to the student data class instance. I show a traditional class here. When a person is instantiated, we can implement validation logic in the constructor as shown. This is fine, but note how we have two concerns in the constructor, one to validate the values and one to save them. Also, there's the complaint about the constructor itself, which we have to write. When I instantiate an instance of person with a negative age, I get a value error raised as expected. We can make data validation cleaner with data classes. However, we have to use some third-party libraries. The ATTR or attribute library enables us to validate data. This library works like the data class module using decorators, type hints, and field level information to make our code cleaner. As you can see, the person class is not a data class, it is a traditional class. The decorator, attr.s, makes this class smells like a data class. Look at the field level information, it's attr.ib. attr.ib supplies field level information like the field function that is built into Python. Although I don't show it, you can specify things like should this field be a part of the string representation or should it be considered as a part of the hash? The spicy thing here is with the age validator and weight validator decorators. Decorating functions with these will validate the corresponding field. Note the naming convention on decorating functions. It's at, followed by the name of the field we want to validate, and then followed by dot, and then the validator word. I will argue that using ATTR makes the code cleaner since we have removed the concern of validating data into their own uniquely identifiable areas. The first instantiation of person should work, but the second one should raise a value error as we are supplying a negative age value. But this is too much for me. ATTR is cool, but now I have to learn another library just to get validation to work. There's another option. 
Pydantic is another library that can help us create a data class with its validation. It's supposed to be a drop-in replacement for data classes. Note that we don't import the data class decorator from the data classes module, rather from the Pydantic data class module. We annotate the check age and check weight functions with the at validator decorator and specify the name of the field that we want to validate with these functions. Pay attention to the fact that we have to return something from the validation functions. If we don't, then the fields which we are validating will be none. I like Pydantic a little bit better than ATTRS since it looks more like what's out of the box available with Python. On the last instantiation, we supply a negative age value and a validation error is raised. This error is a special one from Pydantic and not one from Python. Be careful if you plan to cache these errors as you will have to import the error appropriately. Here is an all-in-one or AIO example of a data class using as many features as possible. First, I'm using the data class decorator from Pydantic. Second, I'm making this data class hashable with the unsafe hash set to true. Third, I'm also specifying for the equality comparison dunders to be provided by setting order to true. You see that the field favorite language will not be stored but will be used to set the isCoder field after initialization. I have four validator functions for the first name, last name, age, and weight. The validators for first and last name title cases the first and last names. The age and weight validator functions are as we have seen before. There's also the ID field that has its value automatically generated. Lastly, this data class can employ the at property decorator as a traditional class can. Here, we turn the full name function into a property. When I print this instance, I'll have a meaningful output. I can access the fields using dot notation. I can call hash on this instance, and I didn't even have to write code for that. Finally, I can convert the instance to a tuple or dictionary as desired. Thanks for watching. We'd love to hear your feedback to create new and better content. Please contact us by going to our website at https oneoffcoder.com. If you need the code, we'll be happy to provide it. Until next time, happy coding, happy learning.